we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed Job 7 verse 9 as a cloud vanishes and it is gone, so one who goes down to the grave does not return. You will not return. The one that goes back to the grave doesn't return to us. And this is a fact of life. Another fact of life is this. Death is a fearful thing. It is frightening. I wasn't here to see what happened the other day. But you see, if you're holding the hands of your lover, let's say your wife, or let me say your spouse, and then the person falls down dead, and you realize that the fellow is dead, the first thing you do is to back off. You don't go close. Even doctors, when they are operating on you, and they realize that you are dead, they remove their gloves, and then they back off. That is how fearful it is. So we are all afraid to die. So when you dream that you are dying, if you don't take care, you go and consult a fetish. Because we all don't want to go that way. But today I want to tell you that that is the way all of us are going. And so prepare so that we will be able to embrace it when our time comes. Death is something that is frightening. 2 Samuel 2, verse 23. You can write that one down. Then the next fact of life is this. Death is a serious matter. Death is a serious matter. Death gives no room or space for amends. When you die, you don't go back to reconcile with anybody. When you die, you don't go back to make amends. At least... I'm sure you are aware of Luke chapter 16 from verse 26. The rich man wanted to come back and then maybe become a preacher now. But Abraham said it is over. There is no space now. You can go home and read Luke 16 from 26 to 31. But let's go back and read Hebrews 9, 27. Hebrews 9, 27. Death will not give space for anyone to make amends. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so once you die, the next thing is to face judgment. So whatever you did in your body, you will stand in judgment and account for what you did in your body. I met this man who was mourning maybe too much. I thought that after the wife was buried and some months have gone by he should have been able to overcome the grief but to me i thought he was not managing it well so i went close to him then i asked what is the problem what is the problem and then he said it to me i will never forget he says that sometimes i feel that i killed my wife i killed my wife sometimes i feel that I killed my wife. So why do you have that feeling? Then he started narrating some stories to me. He never lived at peace with the wife. We didn't know that he was always on the nerves of the wife. Now the woman is gone. The woman cannot come back. And he also, the living, does not have any space. To make amends. The dead is gone. She will not come back. And this man cannot also make the correction. Death is a serious matter. So all of us, in preparation for death, you have to know that there is no space for you to make any correction once you die. Tried as the rich man did, Abraham said, there is a gulf between me and you. You can't jump over. You can't jump over. Let me go and be a preacher. He says, stop. Moses and the rest are preaching. Today, I'm sure heaven will say, Nyamiche and the rest are preaching. Listening to them. There's no space. 
now i've reserved two to the last that one will will challenge our minds a bit but i intentionally reserve those ones for us to keep thinking about them so i have come to the last two death is an enemy death is an enemy first corinthians 15 26 first corinthians 15 26 the last enemy to be destroyed is death the last enemy to be destroyed is death and then he moved on to tell us when that was going to happen verse 27 for he he has put everything under his feet now when it, it says that everything has been put under his feet it is clear that this does not include god himself who put everything under christ so until christ sits on his throne and god puts everything under his feet death will continue to disturb humanity now if death is the last enemy then i want to suggest to all of us that death plays a role in god's agenda for mankind death plays a role the only thing that maybe death does that is good <laughs> is this when it comes around it tries not to pick too many people at a time at a particular place it, it tries so when he picks a lot of them then they will say that this is a genocide this is what this is what so death is a bit strategic <laughs> listen to me today after the discussion you may have the space to discuss again let's say that we are all living on the same street uh, first avenue huh? uh, number one has number one number two <laughs> number three has number four when he picks house number one he won't pick number two if he picks two and he picks three by the time he gets to four this one has vacated the first <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he will travel outside in the country so he picks one and then he leaves the people here as if he's not there and go and pick another one from another avenue by the time he comes here the people have forgotten that he picked someone here i'm sure it is operating on some instructions and so that the human being is not too scared about it because even one out of us at the full glare of us brings some fear what about 10 at the same time so death normally will not do that i thought you would clap for death <laughs> yes, yes how many of us will clap? whether you like it or not these things are facts the earlier you understand them the better how can 120 something people die at our Sports stadium that was just too much that is not uh, what we want death will pick us but it picks us one by one but it is an enemy death has power to destroy to disturb to disengage i said death has power to do what to destroy disturb disengage since it is an enemy it doesn't come to your home to do you good if death is an enemy it doesn't come to your home to do you good certainly it will take a father away it will take a mother away and leave the children bleeding it doesn't do anyone good it will take your husband away it will take your wife away it takes children from the hands of parents and they bleed they bleed death the two more they they bleed death terminates contrast when you have a contract and you don't actually sign it well and you are the boss when you die it is over sometimes you are even dead and the people know that you have a contract your company has a contract yet because the main person is dead wicked people will make sure that their contract is terminated so death terminates contracts it disengages marriages it brings an end to marriages death terminates your job if you are the chief executive in a certain company and you die that position is not reserved for your child 
That is the end. Death terminates all these things. Death terminates all these things. Appointments, relationship, death will terminate it. Your office, death will take it away from you. But I'll combine it with this one, and then I'll draw some conclusions. Another fact of life is this. No one dies for himself or herself. You don't die for yourself. Now, if death picks you, and it doesn't leave any ripple effect on the living, then death would not have been too painful. But death picks you, and it leaves some effect on the living, especially the close uh, family or close friends. Romans 14, verse 7. Shall we read together, ready, go? For none of us lives, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. The next verse is nice. But so let's read the next verse and I'll come back to this one. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So this one can stand on its own. Because this is a fact. And, but the verse 7 can also stand on its own. So let's go back to the verse 7. Shall we shout it? Ready, go. For none of us... So what does that mean? What it means is that you just don't die for yourself alone. The effect of your death is on the living. I went to this school and I saw this lady. I was looking for her, but they said she was praying. I knew where we used to pray. So I was sure she was there. I was getting close to the prayer room. I peeped and I saw that she was there alone, praying. But she's taking a chair, like that. And then she was also sitting on a chair. Then she was pointing the hands to the empty chair like this. So I got closer and then made sure that I heard what she was saying. She was saying that you, God, you took my father away. Then she said, who will pay my school fees? You pay, you pay. And she started crying. When she started crying, I just left the place. I didn't want her to see me. But he said, you have taken my father away. There is school fees to be paid. And then she's saying that you, you will pay. And then she started crying. Sometimes you don't even know how to pray. In the midst of death. If the man died and the man had gone without all these troubles, death would not have been too painful. That is why there are some people who say, who did you Yeah. And so and the wickedness of death is this it comes to a home and then it is so wicked that it takes the breadwinner away if death has actually discussed with the Abusha Penny they would have given death another person yeah because they would have given death another person but he just goes and then picks the breadwinner and then he leaves the whole family destroyed, tattered without hope it is because of this that we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. In this fallen world, you better understand the issues so that you don't destroy your heart. Your faith should be kept. Are we together? Am I speaking to someone? Yes. Yes. So I'll combine these two. The fact that death is an enemy and the fact that you just don't die for yourself alone and that the effect is left on the living, especially those who are close to you, I will suggest two things that we ought to do. Two things, just two things that we ought to do. Number one, try to avoid death too early in life. Try. 
Don't say that this one is in the hands of God. You do your part and leave the rest in the hands of God. You see, Jesus died at 33, eh? So let us also live beyond 33. Try if you can. Sometimes we have a theology that death is in the hands of God. But you see, we work together with God. So try to avoid dying too early in life if you can because of the effect it leaves. I know like in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 12 says something like this. Let's read this one. As fish are caught in a cruel net or bears are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. I know this one. That certain times you are trapped unexpectedly. But oftentimes, you can do something about it. You see, even Jesus, hmm, when they took the stone, they wanted to stone him to death. What did he do? Huh? He snaked through the crowd. Not once, twice. Because he knows that he was not coming to die by stoning. He had to climb the cross. So, and if you, you leave these wicked people to attempt to stone you, but there's time you say, Jack, we will need a third Adam. So, he had to be smart. If he was smart, how many of us should be slothful? We all have to be smart. So smart, oh yeah, and he was gone. He didn't want to die prematurely. Now, lift your hands and look at me. Try, manage it. Manage it if you can. Hmm. All things being equal, manage it. Let's go to Job 28, verse 1. Shall we read together? Ready, go. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Then he will make some argument and come to verse 12. Verse 12. But where can wisdom be found? Now he spoke about a place, a mine for silver, a mine for gold. We go down looking for rubies and all the wonderful minerals. And then he, he asked this question. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Let's go to verse 13, the next verse. Let's read together. Next verse, please. No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. He's saying that wisdom is, is worth more than the gold and the rubies. And it cannot be found in the land of the living. Let's go to verse 15. Verse 15. It cannot be bought with finest gold, nor can it price be weighed out in silver. This is wisdom. Now, so let's go to verse 20. Verse 20. Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? So what is he looking for? Where wisdom abides, where it dwells. Verse 22. Shall we shout this one? Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it has reached our ears. But hold it. Why did they go to ask destruction and death? They are looking for where wisdom is. And they destruction and death they say that only a rumor of it has reached our ears why did the writer bring destruction and death you see because it is wisdom that manages death and manages destruction yeah wisdom can manage death we, we shall all die but wisdom will manage it in kakra 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 and at least push death uh, a bit far try as much as light in you work at it in wisdom and destruction you see when they leave a house in your hands it is only wise people who will be able to maintain it otherwise without wisdom you come and everything is destroyed leave a property for excuse me a foolish person just as ecclesiastes says and everything is destroyed so the manager of death and destruction is what wisdom so you, they inquired of them and they said oh as for boss we don't know where he is we have just had a rumor we, not even a rumor of where he dwells has reached our ears 
now what am i trying to say so by wisdom try to do regular checkups yeah especially when you are aging try and exercise a bit <laughs> we went for a conference and then i saw some of the women you can see with your eyes that they are not strong the, the way they are walking, you see that they are not strong. They don't just want to lift their hands and their legs and exercise their body. See, when you see uh, a vehicle coming with your eyes, if the vehicle is robust, you don't need to touch the body. Sometimes you can weigh it with your own eyes. So when human beings are not strong and their frame cannot hold them, you can see with your eyes. You can see with your eyes because they are not strengthening they are not exercising with wisdom you can delay death for a while am i communicating uh, then you have to take some rest yeah if my wife were here she would have opened her two eyes so who is speaking hey. but today because she's not here i will stress on rest now but listen <laughs> The only thing is that rest is a concept. It is attached to work. It is because of work that is why we have rest. We all had rest after God has worked. So when you are always resting without working, it is laziness. Yeah. So you rest after work. So when you don't work, there is no need for you to rest. So when you are always sleeping in the name of rest, it is slothfulness. Have I interpreted that well? Yes. So you rest. You rest. You see Jesus taking a rest in John. So you go and search for that one. So rest a bit. Rest. One young man died not many months ago. He was rushing around midnight to the mountains. And he had an accident and he died. The car he was using was a big car. But the way the vehicle somehow sorted, people saw that the speed was just too much. You see, when you are speeding, remember that you can go home too early. So manage the speed limits. Some of you are young men and you have nice vehicles. Sometimes, don't think about yourself. Think about the reckless one coming and the one behind you. Drive with some wisdom. So you can prolong your life a bit. So you are not claimed because of accidents. Living within your means. When you borrow too much, like a certain country, you'll be in trouble. Yes. Hmm. You'll be in trouble. And the trouble will affect many people. And <laughs> some of you, if you are like that country, you'd have been dead by now. Because the stress will be too much. Yeah. So live within your means. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand you. Some of you, when you see someone in a necklace, hey, F -O -O -E, I mean, why don't you take... Meanwhile, today I was coming to church and I decided to put on a brand new shoe. This is the first time I've put my foot in it. But me, when I arrive here, nobody is even praising my shoe. <laughs> you see, not even my area head. <laughs> he doesn't even care about my shoe. So you see, we worry ourselves just for nothing. And we die prematurely. All sort of stress life. Why? <laughs> you see, the problem I have is that... Oh, you are clapping. You clap. <laughs> That's why I said I'm leaving the last one for this time. You see, people work very hard to get money. And now... The doctors will intentionally invite them. Don't eat this. You can't eat that. You can't eat that. Not that he has money. Don't take sugar. Don't take milk. When he didn't have money, <laughs> you see, he stresses himself. And now the body cannot even eat anything sweet. That is how, how, how mobile we are. Don't eat that. <laughs> 
A certain apostle went to see the doctor, and the doctor said, Don't eat rice. <laughs> so, our devil, devil, rice, they made it. <laughs> don't eat rice. Say, Rice, they made it. But when the doctor says, Make sure that you don't take this because you are diabetic, don't see Coke and say that, Mekondo, that you'll be dealing foolishly with your life. You go to the premature grave. I don't know how the angels receive people like this, but I can suggest to you. So when they see you coming, <laughs> they'll say, who is this? <laughs> then you say, I'm so sorry. So, so, why? <laughs> eh? why are you coming? There's so much work to be done. <laughs> Some of them, will dis- they will be discussing whether we should beat him and let him go back or we should accept him. Don't take what I'm saying for granted. The problem we have in life, and many of us, we die because of a stressful life. Are you going to obey Yeah. Stressful life. And some of the men too, they are married, but they are managing other women. That one too is stressful. Very, very stressful. And some of you too, you are managing some men. Even on yourself, on your mobile phones, the kind of messages you have. When you see your husband coming, you are stressed. These things will kill you, I'm telling you for a fact. It will take you to a premature grave. Number two. Put your house always in order. Put your house always in order before you die. Because you don't die for yourself. So try to put your house in order before you die. It is necessary to put your house in order before you embrace death. I'll give you two scriptures. I'm sure it will be self-explanatory. Isaiah 38 verse 1 Isaiah 38 verse 1 this is God himself going to speak in those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death the prophet Isaiah son of Amos, went to him and said this is what the Lord says what put your house in order because you are going to die you will not recover so when God knew that Hezekiah was going to die, God had to tell Hezekiah that we don't die without putting our houses in order. So put your house in order. And then we have also said that wisdom manages well. At least it can push it a bit back. Let's go and see this wise man and his action. Second Samuel 17 verse 23. 2 Samuel 17, 23. How many teenagers are here? Eh? Teenagers, they don't like this kind of preaching. But learn it when you are even a teenager, that that is a road that we are all going. 2 Samuel 17, 23. Shall we read together? When Ahitophel, you know Ahitophel? Those days, the Bible says, when he spoke, it was as if God himself was speaking very wise man so look at a wise man and his action when Ahitophel saw that his advice had not been followed he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown he put his house in order and then hanged himself so he died and was buried in his father's house we don't want you to hang yourself but when this wise man knew that he was going to kill himself he even put his house in order. So all of us should put your house in order. Don't say that I don't have houses now. How much do I have? If you have hundred cities, put it in order. Let your wife know where the hundred cities is. Put it in order. Let your husband know. Let whoever is supposed to know, know. Because sometimes you can be trapped. But it is always best when you have managed your life very well. And in your old age, You discuss about death. You discuss your will. And you tell them that it is here, it is here. Oh, uh, and then you let them know that soon you'll be, you, you'll be, you'll be taken away. And like the old man, Simeon, he says, Lord, let me now depart in peace. So we depart this world in peace at a good old age. When that happens, people do not mourn that much. Because by that time, your children... Some of them are 70, others are 60. But when you die and the children are four years, five years, sometimes it bleeds the heart. 
Have I communicated? Fine. I pray that God will help all of us. So let me conclude. Let me conclude. I'll conclude with a very good news. Proverbs 16, verse 7. Proverbs 16, verse 7. But this time, I want it from the King James Version. King James Version. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. When your ways please the Lord, even your enemies make peace with you. So we have said that death is an enemy. So let's say that for us, we are justified by faith. And therefore, we have peace with God himself. Because of Christ and our faith in the resurrection and the blood, we have been saved and we please God now. Because with that faith, it is impossible to please God. Our faith in Christ has made us children of God. Now, let's go back to Proverbs 16, 7, please. When a man's ways please the Lord. So now, all of us, because of Christ, we have pleased the Lord. So death, who is our enemy? When it comes to us, Stephen, I hope you are not afraid. Yeah. Because I'm going to be deaf, so you will not die. So let's say I come to him deaf. I come to his house. This man, his ways has pleased the Lord. So when the enemy comes, he makes peace with him. <laughs> so he picks Stephen, and the best or the worst it can do is to take you to the Father who is in white and white. It will take you straight to God. So absent in the body, death takes you to be present with the Lord. That is what it means. So for us, nobody should fear that enemy. When it comes, it will take you straight to the Lord. So our brother is going to be with the Lord. He has gone home. And God will take care of the rest. So, like Jesus said, weep for yourself. Don't disturb your spirit because of the wife and the children. God knows what to do. If you see lunatics on the streets, they take food that is destroyed, spoiled. Food that is spoiled. Yet they eat it and they keep going. But you go and try. You may die or you will get sick. They will say food poisoning, but for them, not food poisoning. God knows that they are not correct in their mind. So when they take the food, God breathes upon it. He takes care of the lunatic. He will take care of our brother Pepper's wife and the children. Soon you will see that he will do it. He will fix them at places where you never imagine. God will bring strength to the wife. He will bring strength to the children. He will bring strength to all of us. But as I end, let's read Hebrews chapter 6. Shall we all rise to read Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 16? Shall the choir be made ready, please? Hebrews 6 from 16. Shall we read? Ready, go. People swear by someone greater than... And the oath confirms what is said and put an end to all arguments. 17. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the ends of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. The next verse. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us. Yeah, God wants us to be greatly encouraged. He doesn't lie. Now, verse 19. Let us shout verse 19. We have this hope as for firm and it enters. Verse 20. Where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Shall we lift up our hands and begin to open our mouth and pray? What did he tell you? 
what did he tell what did you hear him say today how are you going to manage your life henceforth shall we open our mouth and begin to pray Malene veneme no sali branda baya iko ravana maha senevedes razada braga da baha sende veneme veneme neme no sala branda imako saya neveneme help us lord help us lord help us lord stand fast and show what the pillows roll Yes, we have an call that keeps that soul steadfast and sharp while there be this elder of ours who was a steward for one of Nigeria's president Obasanjo so when I was discussing with him about this Nigeria I asked of how old the former president of Nigeria is at the time he said he was around 84 thereabout then I said but that man looks strong and this elder told me he planned to live long. He said, Obasanjo planned to live long. When you plan to live long, there are certain places you will not sit. There are certain things you will not touch. There are certain foods that you will not eat when you plan to live long. There's a certain lifestyle that you will not lead. I want you to make some decisions because we have to be around to do the work and possess the nations so how are you going to plan to live long what are you going to do now num number two apart from planning pray about long life pray that God give me long life add prayer to it because he has life and he can give whosoever he wants to give Shall we lift up our hands? Oh, 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 o